drink and we're off. Okay. Everybody see, see what's going on here? Okay, so uh, again, welcome uh, to everybody. Uh, I'm Professor Aaron Mayer from the Martin Zeus <coughs> Department of Land of Israel Studies and Archaeology at Bar-Ilan University. Um, I'm an archaeologist who, who I've been ex directing the excavations at an important Philistine site at Gath of the Philistines, which I'll talk about very soon, uh, for close to 25 years. Um, as you can see on the screen, <coughs> you have both the uh, the uh, the uh, website of the project, wordpress.com, and also uh, those of you who are interested in uh, reading further on some of the topics that I'll be talking about, if you go to my academia.edu page, you can find almost all of my um, uh, articles there in various forms. So that's something to look uh, uh, into. Now, um, what we're going to try to do now for the next, um, let's say, 40 minutes or something of the sort, is give a, a very quick overview of who the Philistines were, um, and from a perspective that's trying to integrate um, what's doing nowadays in current research in our understanding of the Philistines, and incorporating that into what we thought about the Philistines in the past on the one hand, and how that fits in with the uh, other sources that tell us about the Philistines, and in particular, the biblical texts. So um, let's start, and um, I hope you have a great time. So a little background first. Uh, around 1200 BC, that's the end of the period that uh, archaeologists call the Late Bronze Age, and the beginning of the period that we call the Iron Age. Now, the Late Bronze Age was a period in which throughout the Eastern Mediterranean, as you can see in the map on the slide, uh, there was a very, very specific and very well-defined world order. There were, um, there were um, empires such as the Egyptian Empire and the Hittite Empire and further to the east, the Babylonian Kingdom and the Assyrian Kingdom. And there were um, groups of city-states such as in uh, Greece of today, we had the various Mycenaean city-states, uh, and other um, political entities. And in the area of the Eastern uh, part of the Mediterranean, this was what we would call Can the Can Canaan, or that's where the Canaanites lived. And it was mainly comprised of a lot of small city-states who were under either Egyptian rule of the Egyptian empire or Hittite rule. And a little before 1200 BCE, all this starts coming apart. Now, it's not an overnight event that one day there's the Late Bronze Age and one day the next day there's the Iron Age, but in a period of about 150 years, all the various pieces of this puzzle uh, started to come apart. Uh, and what you have is that um, the Hittite uh, Empire basically falls apart. The Egyptian Empire uh, slowly becomes weaker. Um, international trade, that was very, very vibrant during the Late Bronze Age. Uh, Peter's down, the same with the diplomatic connections. Um, for example, in the area of Canaan, uh, many of the uh, city-states uh, start going through a, a process of uh, abandonment, some are destroyed, and all this goes on for about 150 years. In Greece, most of the Mycenaean city-states are abandoned, destroyed, or uh, significantly weakened. This is apparently the time of the the famous Trojan War, and things are coming apart. And one of the things that we see at this time is also the appearance of all kinds of new uh, groups and cultural entities that we begin to hear about. For example, the Israelites, the earliest evidence of the uh, Israelites is from an inscription by the Pharaoh Merenachtach, which is about 1210 uh, BCE, and that's the first extra biblical mention of the Israelites. We know more or less at this time that the Arameans appear. And most importantly, we know from the Egyptian sources uh, that around this time, um, there start appearing um, groups of peoples who the, um, who the Egyptians said that they come from the islands of the sea. And the modern term for these peoples are the sea peoples. 
and there are various groups among the Sea peoples. And um, in particular, in the mortuary temple of Ramses III, a king of the uh, beginning of the 20th dynasty in Egypt, at the very beginning of the 12th century BC, that's just after 1200 uh, BC, uh, on the, uh, the walls of his temple, among other things, he describes uh, battles that he supposedly con conducted against these sea peoples and among them, the Philistines. And you can see here uh, portions of the land battle and portion of, portions of the sea battle uh, in which the Egyptians supposedly are, um, are, are uh, beating the, the sea peoples. And among the sea peoples, there's a group, which if we translate it into uh, modern terms, it's the Philistines. One of the groups of the sea peoples were the Philistines. Now, um, here we have a depiction of the, uh, of, the, of the Philistines. And you can see here, they're very, very clearly differentiated. Here are the Egyptians, uh, pointed with my mouse here, as opposed to the Philistines, which will have very unique hats, very unique equipment and other things. And it's clear that these are people that the, um, that the Egyptians marked out as very different and as a threat to the order of the Egyptian empire. And what's very interesting is that at quite a long time ago in the archeological research of the land of Israel, um, a group of very, very specific types of coffins, what we call um, anthropoid, uh, anthropomorphic coffins or anthropoid coffins, that means coffins in the shape of, of uh, humans, were found at sites at the very end of the late Bronze Age and the beginning of the Middle Age. And for many, many years, scholars assume that since some of the depictions of the, on these coffins are similar to the depictions of the sea peoples in the uh, Medina Habu Ruiz, is that what we have here are uh, tombs of the Philistines. So, and this is something that if you open up just about any introductory text on, on the land of Israel, on the archaeology of the land of Israel dealing with the Philistines, this is there. And the bottom line is it's probably not correct. Okay, so what happened? So apparently, sometime around 1200, um, one of these groups of sea peoples, and we'll call them uh, the Philistines, start settling in the southern coastal plain of modern day Israel. That's the area between more or less Tel Aviv, which is about over here, and Gaza, which is about over here. This is the area which uh, we call in modern terms the southern coastal plain, and in biblical geography, would be called Philistia. And in, in this area, we have five um, central Philistine cities which are mentioned in the Bible as well, Ashdod in the north, Ashkelon and Gaza along the coast. Well, the, two, the three of these are identified very clearly because their names are retained there today. And inland you have Ekron uh, over here and Gat uh, Telesafi, which we'll talk about where I've excavated. And these are the five cities of the so-called Philistine Pentapolis, Pentapolis the five cities, which are well known from the biblical text. Now, the Egyptian sources, late after the time of the uh, Medina Habu reliefs, also tell us of the settlement of the Philistines in this area. And we start getting a picture that there's a group in the southern um, coastal plain um, who are settling there. Now, just about at the same time, there's another group who are marked off in green who start settling and forming a culture in the early Iron Age. And these are the Israelites. And these, this is the beginning of the process of the formation of the Israelite culture, which with time throughout the Iron Age will eventually develop into the Judai kingdom, the Israelite kingdom, um, and all kinds of other aspects that go on until the end of the Iron Age, 586 BCE, when Jerusalem is destroyed by the Babylonians. Now, the biblical text, which describes the interactions, among other things, the interactions between the Philistines and the Israelites, and as you know, most of the time, the, the depiction of the Philistines is that of an enemy, an adversary, even though if you read in the text, sometimes they're depicted as neighbors. And I always like saying, take the Samson stories, and he is most of the time killing Philistines and eventually killed by the Philistines. 
But in in between, he marries a couple of Philistines. He keep he likes visiting Philistia. So there's an ongoing uh, complex relationship be between the two. And of course, the biblical text, which some of it is written in the Iron Age, some of it is written later, depicts the Israelite viewpoint on the Philistines. We don't have the Philistine Bible that depicts the Israelites from their point of view. So you have to take into account that what we know about the Philistines through the biblical text is seen through a, an ideological um, lens that interprets the Philistines as the Israelites wanted to see them. And one of the things that's nice about the archaeological remains is we can add some, if you want, some flesh on the bones of, uh, about what's going on with the Philistines from, a Philistine, from the Philistine side. So let's start talking about what happened. So right after 1200, we have in, in Philistia the first signs of settlement of a new culture um, in Philistia. And very early on in the research, it was, it was seen that the, with the appearance of the Philistine culture, you have the appearance of all kinds of aspects of material culture, archeological finds, which are very um, foreign to the land of Israel. And perhaps the most famous is, is the Philistine pottery. And at the early stage of the appearance of the Philistine culture, we have a type of pottery, which archeologists call either Philistine one, or if you wanna get technical Mycenaean three C. And this pottery is almost identical to the pottery that you find at the same time in Greece, but it's locally made. And this was seen as an indication that a group of immigrants came from the Aegean, from the Mycenaean culture, and traveled either by sea or by land, landed in, in, uh, in Philistia, and started the, the Philistine culture. And in fact, when I studied archaeology way back too long ago, um, I don't it's more than 30 years, uh, the, the narrative was quite simple. The Philistines were people who came from the Mycenaean culture, who landed in Philistia, and brought with them a Mycenaean culture. And the early Philistine culture is Mycenaean, more or less. And with time, slowly they lost their Aegean aspects and they assimilated with the, with the Levantine cultures. Until the end of the Iron Age, they had lost their, um, their, all, all their foreigners. And this is something that nowadays we have a very hard time to accept. And we'll talk about this again in a moment. And here, for example, at the site of Ashdod, one of the five important Philistine cities in the earliest Philistine level, we have Again, the specific type of early uh, Philistine uh, pottery. Uh, what you do, what happens afterwards, and this is a nice example from the next level, archaeological level that I showed, as soon after their arrival, the Philistines start going through a, uh, a very complex transformation, which goes on for about 600 years. And um, within 50 to 100 years after their arrival, uh, or the appearance of the Philistines in Canaan, we start seeing that the pottery changes and the pottery goes from what we call um, Mycenaean 3C Philistine 1 to a new type of pottery called Philistine Vipro or Philistine 2. And in this pottery, you have a very interesting mix of all kinds of motifs, local and foreign, uh, Egyptian, Canaanite, uh, Cypriot, etc., all coming together. And it's again a very nice example how the, um, the, the Philistine culture is it's going through this ongoing process of change. And perhaps one of the most famous um, objects from, uh, from Ashdod is a figurine, which we call the Ashdoda figurine. And in Hebrew, it's a short for the, the Doda from Ashdod. That means the ant from Ashdod, because it's a figurine of a woman. And it, it's a very interesting figurine in the fact that some of the parts of the figurine, of this figurine, remind us of Mycenaean type figurines but other aspects and its decoration are very much not nice in it. And this is a nice example of this combination uh, of motifs. Uh, when we go on to Ashkelon, Ashkelon is a very important, large city throughout history along the, the southern coastal plain of, of Israel. Uh, it's a trade emporium. And by the way, the very name Ashkelon comes from the Semitic group to Way. Um, and so, it, uh, and that's important in trade. And uh, the Philistines settle here and create a, uh, a new city. 
And when we look at the material remains, we can see on the one hand the Mycenaean pre uh, pottery, the sign of the early Philistine culture. And on the other hand, another thing which we know is quite typical of the early uh, Philistines is that we have, instead of the typical loom waste used for weaving, that we had in the Levant before and after, which were usually a ball with a hole in it. It sort of looks the size of a softball with a hole, and that was, and, and you know, hung those from the loom. Uh, when the Philistines appear, we see a new type of, uh, of loom weight, and it's basically a, a, a pinched cylinder of, uh, of dried clay, and that is tied around the strings of the loom. And this seems to be an evidence that the people who come to Philistia with the early Philistine culture are first of all not only men and potters making Philistine one pottery, but also women, because the women are usually those who conduct weaving um, at the time, and they were bringing with them traditions that are not similar to the weaving traditions in the land of Israel. Uh, another very important site is Tel Nikne Ekron. Tel Nikne Ekron is a large site which uh, was excavated by a joint Israeli-American excavation for many years. And what they found at Tel Nikne Ekron is that during the late Bronze Age, there was a small settlement that was more or less uh, limited to this part of the site. And then at the beginning of the early, of the early Iron Age, with the appearance of the Philistine culture, uh, a large fortified city was built uh, on the site. And the entire character of the of this uh, uh, site changed. And we find, again, the Mycenaean 3C uh, pottery. And we find architecture, for example, buildings. This might have been some sort of a temple or um, hearths, very special types of, uh, of fireplaces, which are very not local in character that appear at the time. And we get the feeling that there's a lot of different types of uh, early uh, of non-local aspects in the Philistine culture. And for example, this is another um, uh, uh, portion of, of a building, perhaps a temple, some cultic items, uh, etc. Et now, the interesting question though, is the Philistine, early Philistine culture really a gene? And as I was hinting at before, nowadays we can see more and more that while, for example, the Philistine one pottery is very similar to Mycenaean 3C. We don't have all the Mycenaean 3C vessels in the Philistine repertoire. That means when they, whoever came from wherever they came and they decided also to bring and make um, Mycenaean 3C pottery in the early Philistine culture, they didn't use all the vessels that they have back in, in the Aegean where this pottery originates. On the other hand, some of the cult and some of the architecture and some other aspects tell us that it's not only from the Aegean, some things come from Cyprus, some come from Anatolia, the area of modern day Turkey, some come from Northern Syria, some come from farther afield from, from Egypt. And more and more, we have the feeling nowadays that the early um, Philistine culture is really a combination of all kinds of cultures from all kinds of parts of the of the Mediterranean that came together. And in fact, there were even locals, Canaanites, who were also uh, at the time uh, living in Philistia. And all these various entangled cultural elements, and we call them entangled culture, combined together. And if you want, uh, I would say it's a Mediterranean salad, not a Greek salad, a Mediterranean salad that, that combined together to, um, to uh, produce what we call the uh, early Philistine culture. Now, after the first stage of the Philistine culture, we see that the Philistines start expanding outside of the, uh, the core of the five settlements, the five cities of, of Philistine. And an example of this is Tel Kassila, which is a site which is situated within modern day Tel Aviv on the, uh, the northern banks of the Yarkon River. And this is probably the northernmost expansion of the Philistines. And at this site, they, they build a settlement, and the settlement has a series of temples. Here, that's the temple area. And these are the three temples, one on top of another, that were built on the site. And this 
uh, temple was built not at the very early stage of the Philistine settlement, but let's say 100 years later. And we see here, for example, one of the stages of the temple with the temple courtyard, the entrance to the temple, and a small subsidiary temple in the back. Here's a, a, a reconstruction and a plan. And here are some of the unique items that we have from the Philistine temple. Now, a very interesting thing is for many, many years, the only well excavated, remote documented Philistine temple that we had in Philistia was from Tel Tassilo. And we had very few temples, if at all, in, at the Philistine sites. We've changed that since then. But uh, at, the, at the time, this was the situation. But in recent years, things have began to change. And we now have Philistine temples both at the Philistine sites, the main Philistine site, and recently also a Philistine temple was excavated at a small rural site in the northwestern Negev. Here you can see the site of um, Nahal Patish right over here. Um, this is um, to the west of uh, Be'er Sheva. Be'er Sheva comes out somewhere around over here. And here you can see the building and an interesting focal object that was found there uh, and there. And even more recently, um, when they were building a, a, a bomb shelter, in the city of Yavne, on a hill opposite um, the, the ancient Tel of Yavne, they came upon a, uh, a pit in which thousands upon thousands of cultic objects have been um, deposited. And even though we haven't uh, located the temple at Yavne, this is probably what we call a fabisa, a cultic repository of objects, cultic objects that went out of use in this temple, and it gives us an astounding uh, and very different view of, uh, of some of the uh, Philistines. But let's go to Tel Asafigat. I can't let you get away with talking a little about Tel Asafigat. I've been excavating there for uh, almost 25 years. Unfortunately, this summer we won't be excavating due to the corona. I hope to be back there again in the summer of 2021, and you're all invited, of course. And this is uh, a, one of the largest um, uh, sites in Israel, uh, comprised of a large upper and lower city. Here you can see several views. And it's also the uh, west, the easternmost of the Philistine sites and the closest one uh, to Judah. And that's why in the biblical text, Gat, the city of Gat appears more than all of the other, uh, any of the other uh, Philistine cities. And we've excavated in various parts of the site, and you can see the various excavations air, air, areas on the upper tail and the lower tail and the siege system that surrounds the site. And I'll talk a little about some of the finds. And for example, here's a small temple that we found in the upper city with remains of a, a temple with two columns, which sort of reminds us of the Samson story of how he knocked out over the pillars of a temple in Gaza perhaps indicating that the, um, those who wrote the story knew what a Philistine temple looked like and you could stand between the, 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 uh, the pillars and knock them down. Um, we found um, hints to a Philistine cemetery and up till quite recently, one of the big questions about the Philistines was how did they bury themselves? How did they, we, one, thing, one thing's for sure we know about the Philistines is that they died. There's no question about that. And, um, but we hadn't found uh, any major Philistine cemeteries. And as I said before, the uh, anthropoid coffins, we now know that they're not Philistines. So where are the Philistines? And recently we found a Philistine cemetery at Gat and a Philistine cemetery at Ashkelon, which was, uh, is, has been partially published. And we're starting to get an idea about who the Philistines were. And um, for example, this uh, cave that we excavated, even though it was, uh, partially robbed, we still have some great finds. And one of the very, very important aspects that now we can deal with with, um, with, with modern excavation and analysis of burials is we have a whole toolkit of, of analyses that was not available just um, 10, 15, 20 years ago. And that's ancient DNA, isotopic analysis, and all kinds of other things, which tell us interesting uh, information about who these people are what they're eating, what their health is, uh, where they're from, uh, and, and, and all kinds of other questions. Now, the most interesting and predominant find that we've had at Gat, at Tel Asafi, throughout all the seasons of excavations, and I must say it's a lot of fun excavating, is 
um, the destruction of the city around 11, uh, 830 BCE by Hazael, the king of Aram Damascus. This is an event that's briefly noted in 2 Kings 12, either se verse 17 or 18, depending on what version of the Bible you're reading. And throughout the site, wherever we excavated, we found uh, houses which were burnt down and collapsed with thousands and thousands of finds. And um, archaeologists love the destruction of other people because it provides great finds and uh, it keeps the volunteers highly motivated to find a, a complete juggernaut. It's, it's a lot of fun. But more importantly, this tells us a very, very interesting story. And it tells us that during the 11th, 10th, and 9th century, up till 830 BCE, Gat was the largest city in Philistia and perhaps in the entire southern Levant, the entire land of Israel. And it was a focal point for political control for tr international trade and all kinds of other things. And in one fell swoop, uh, Hazael, the king of Aram Damascus, who was, the, who was the, the neighborhood bully at that time, comes down to Philistia, besieges the site and destroys it and destroys it so thoroughly that it was never rebuilt. In fact, it was so thoroughly destroyed that um, um, skeletons of people were left out in the open unburied. And this was an enormous change uh, in, in the geopolitical mosaic of, of the Southern Levant in the late ninth century. And after this, other Philistine star, uh, uh, sites started becoming important, such as Ashkelon and Ekron. And for example, it opened up the Shfela for the Judite kingdom, which up until then, they had to face the, the kingdom of, of God. And here, for example, is a a temple that, that we excavated in the lower city. You can see a very interesting uh, horned altar that we excavated and all kinds of other great finds that were found with it. And along with it, we found uh, the fascinating remains of a siege trench uh, and a siege system that was built around the site. Here you can see it in an aerial photo and on the plan. And it surrounds the site from the eastern, southern, and western side. And on the northern side, it simply utilized the existing um, uh, riverbed, and the Arameans surrounded the site, um, did enable the, uh, the def defenders to escape, to attack the, uh, the besieging army, or to receive supplies, and they waited it out, and at some time, we don't know how long it took, days, weeks, months, they attacked the city and destroyed the city completely, and here you can see, for example, a portion of the of the enormous trench that the uh, that the Arameans excavated around the site, uh, it's something like two kilometers long. It would have taken an enormous amount of, uh, of manpower and, and effort to do it, all this while they were fighting. But this was what enabled the Arameans to besiege and destroy uh, the city of God. Now, one of the very interesting questions about the Philistines is, is what did the Philistines eat? And, um, there is very clear evidence that with the appearance of the Philistine culture, there are very interesting changes in uh, dietary uh, patterns and habits among the Philistines. For example, we have evidence of pork and dog meat consumption. We have new plants that are in use, whether plants that didn't exist in the land of Israel and were brought first at this time, or first use of plants that were in the land of Israel that were not used before. And you get the feeling that the people who were calling the Philistines brought with them all kinds of various new types of behaviors. And this is behaviors on a very uh, daily level that they're changing. But, um, and this is an important but, things are not as simple as we once thought. Because it used to be that they would say, if you have pork meat, if you have pork, it's Philistines. If you don't have pork, it's either Canaanites or Israelites at this time. And it turns out that it's a little more complicated than that because some Philistines ate pork, some didn't. And it turns out that some locals don't eat pork. For example, the Judites, but if you go to the northern Israelite kingdom, some of the Israelites do eat pork. So there is some very Clear differences between the cultures, but it's not a black and white situation as perhaps presented in the past. Another very interesting question is what do the Philistines speak and write? Now, if we're saying that the Philistines, or at least some of them, came from outside the land of Israel, 
if they may have come from regions where they didn't speak Semitic languages like Hebrew or Aramaic, or Canaanite, etc., or perhaps spoke languages like Greek, Hittite, which belong to the Indo European um, uh, languages. And for many, many years, people have pointed out that some of the terms and names that the Philistines are referred to in the biblical and other texts, such as Saren, the leader of the, the Philistines, or the names such as Goliath or Achish, uh, are not Semitic names. So it was very often assumed that the Philistines spoke some sort of a Greek-like language, and when they came, they wrote using writing systems that were brought uh, by them from the Aegean area, and in the Aegean area at this time, more or less, we know writing systems such as Linear B, uh, Cipro Minoan, etc. And for many, many years, uh, we've been searching for these writing systems. And I'll, I'll, I'll tell you a secret that I used to have uh, uh, many dreams of finding the archive of Philistine documents. And I was hoping it would be a bilingual archive in, in Philistine and, and, you know, and Canaanite so I could interpret it. But after 25 years excavating at Ga and more than uh, 100 years excavating at Philistia, we haven't found it. And it seems to be that besides a few small inscriptions, which are undeciphered and most probably not related to the Aegean scripts, it seems that perhaps the Philistines didn't write. And this is an important point. Nowadays, we always think that a language comes with writing. But um, many, many languages in the past and many cultures in the past, and even till today, don't necessarily write down their languages. And it could very well be that even if some of the Philistines came from the Mycenaean culture where they wrote, once the, 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 the Mycenaean uh, palaces were destroyed, the need for writing in the Aegean disappeared. And in fact, we don't have writing in Greece for several hundred years. And when the Philistines came to the land of Israel, they didn't bring with them the writing systems from Greece. They didn't need to write. And only a couple of centuries later, when they started learning um, and, and having a more sophisticated culture, they learned the alphabetic writing from the local Levantines. And the earliest text that we have in alphabetic writing from Philistia is a, a text that we found at Telesapi, which seems to be, as we interpret it, a text which mentions two names, something like Alwat and Walat, which are not uh, Semitic names, but rather Indo-European names. And these two names are quite similar to the name Goliath, which indicates that somewhere around 1000 BCE, the Philistines were already using the local writing system, the alphabetic writing system, and they were still retaining uh, non-local names um, in their daily uh, use. Now, uh, we've talked about this, and it's common. Okay, then, back to burials. So we said we don't have very uh, much evidence of burials. As we said, the anthropoid coffins, we can knock them off of this. And um, there have been other types of burials that have been suggested that, for example, uh, at the site of, uh, uh, of Azor, which is in uh, not far from Tel Aviv, they found a cemetery, probably a cemetery that's used by people who are affiliated with the Philistines, and they found cremation burials and burials in jars. As I said, up until recently, we really didn't know how the Philistines uh, are buried themselves. And the truth is, even through today, the, um, the amount of burials that we have is minimal. And if there's one thing that I think will be the most important development in the archaeology of uh, Philistines in the coming years would be the excavation of one, two, or three large cemeteries to give us an idea of who these people are, where they're coming from, what their culture, what they're eating, uh, etc. Now, uh, just quickly go over uh, some of the aspects of the development. So as I said, you can follow the development of the Philistine culture through how the, among other things, the pottery changes. And you, here you can see an example of in the various stages of Philistine, early Philistine decorated pottery. And it's very clear that you have an a mixture of various influences coming in together uh, and slowly changing the Philistine culture. But until the very end of the Iron Age, a Philistine is a Philistine. And if you would, if we go through a, a time tunnel and land in uh, the border between Philistia and Judah, let's say at 700 BCE, and catch a Philistine and catch a Judite and start asking them who they are, the Philistine 
would identify himself as a Philistine or from a Philistine city, and the Judite would clearly know that the Philistine was not one of his. They were clear differentiations between uh, these two cultures. So what can we say uh, about the development of the culture? So first of all, there's no evidence of a single group of uniform origin. And this is very different from the picture that we had in the past. It's cultural influences from various sources, local and foreign. Um, there's almost no evidence of the destruction of the Canaanite sites when they appear. And so it seems that what we have here is a culture that came together from various places and formed an entangled culture, a complex culture, which then became the Philistine culture. And this is the culture that throughout the Iron Age interacted with its, uh, with its surroundings, influencing cultures on the Levant, being influenced by the cultures uh, in the Levant, but still retaining a unique uh, culture. Now, now that we described how um, they developed, let's spend the, the final minutes in talking about what happened towards the end of the Iron Age. After um, Philistine goddess destroyed in the 8th and 7th century, the site of, 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 uh, of Ekron, um, you can see it right over here, and here's a plan of it, uh, becomes a large uh, uh, city, and in fact becomes what some people have called the olive oil capital of the world, of the Eastern Mediterranean, and under the auspices of the uh, Neo-Assyrian Empire, the Assyrians were ruling this region at that time, they developed extensive uh, olive oil production and apparently exported it throughout the Mediterranean. And they become one of the major um, uh, sites in Philistia at the time. And they're mentioned often in the Assyrian records. And for example, here you can see evidence of the olive oil production at the site. Um, and here's a, uh, an artist's reconstruction of several of the, uh, a group of, uh, of houses with the olive oil uh, production at Ekron uh, towards the end of the Iron Age. And another very interesting find at Ekron is a royal temple. And in this royal temple, which was enormous compared to all the temples we had before at Philistine cities, there was a very, very important inscription. Perhaps it's for sure the most important inscription found in Philistia and one of the most important inscriptions found in the land of Israel uh, in any periods. And in this inscription, it tells us that this is a temple that was built by Achish, the son of Padi, the son of Yassad, the son of Ada, son of Yair, the ruler of Ekron, uh, for Padgaya, his lady, that's his goddess. May she bless him and protect him and prolong his days and bless his land. So first of all, it's great finding inscription is, is completed this. Second of all, we know that this is Ekron, the identity, he's the ruler of Ekron. Third, it's very interesting that we have a whole list of names of the, of the kings of, of, uh, of Ekron in, in, the, uh, in the 8th century. And importantly, Achish, Akish. We know that name as the, uh, as the king of Gat in the Bible. And here we have him as the king of uh, Ekron. And perhaps Achish is a dynastic name that was used uh, by various Philistines um, uh, throughout the Iron Age. Then we go on to another site, Philistine Ashkelon. And Philistine Ashkelon is during the 9th, 8th, and 7th century, a major port with connections throughout the Mediterranean with astoundingly rich finds um, excavated by uh, an expedition uh, from the uh, University of Harvard. Here you can see the late uh, Larry Sager, who was the um, uh, director of the excavations. And they find an impressive site um, of the late Philistine culture. And all this in 604 is completely destroyed. Um, towards the end of the seventh century, the, um, the Babylonian empire replaces the Assyrian empire as the ruler of Southern Levant. And um, they take over Philistia also. And the Philistine cities that remain made this mistake of revolting against the Babylonians. In 604, um, Nebuchadnezzar, the same Nebuchadnezzar who destroyed Jerusalem about 20 years later, um, uh, campaigns the Philistine cities, destroys the Philistine cities completely, and kills the inhabitants, raises the cities completely, and the few that are left are sent to exile in, in Mesopotamia and Babylon. And 
basically with that, the Philistine culture ends. And it ends in such total suddenness that it's very clear that we have a, a complete change in what happens um, in Philistia. And in fact, some scholars claim that after the Babylonian destruction, for quite a long period, Philistia was virtually devoid of, of inhabitants. And only later, when half people came, they were already Phoenicians. And this is a very interesting point, because this tells us something that people very often ask me. What's the connection between the different Philistines and the modern day Palestinians? So the answer is yes and no, like most, like most answers. So the, the, why, why is there a connection? Is that, let's we'll start it this way. They're not genetically or culturally related because at the end of the Iron Age, the Philistines culture ends, doesn't continue. Uh, but what happened is yet during the Iron Age, when the, when the Philistines still lived in Philistia, the Greeks as merchants, as mercenaries came to this region and started calling this region something like Palestina in, in, in Greek, in early Greek. And this became the name of this region. And even after the Philistines didn't live in Philistia, the region of the southern coastal plain was called Philistia. And after 135 BC, the CE, after the Bar Kokhba revolt of the Jews against the, uh, the Romans, as a punishment for the Jews for having revolted against the Romans, the Romans decided to change the name of the entire land of Israel from Judea to Philistia. And they changed the uh, Palestina. They changed the name of the entire land Palestina. And from that point onwards, anybody who lived in the land of Israel up until 1948 and the founding of, the, of, the, uh, of modern day Israel, anybody who lived in Israel, including Jews, Christians, or Muslims, was called Palestinian. And that's why Palestinians are called Palestinian. It's connected by name to the Philistines, but it's not connected culturally or genetically uh, to these people. And with that story of the Philistines end, and it's very interesting that just a little, more or less at the same point, the, the Judites go through a similar trajectory because a few years later, um, the, the, Judaic, the, the Judean kingdom um, revolts against the Babylonians and the Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar comes to Jerusalem, destroys Jerusalem and the temple and the, and the kingdom of Judah and the uh, most of the uh, inhabitants of, of Judah are exiled either to Babylon or to Egypt. But as opposed to the Philistines, who very quickly lost their communal identity, the Jews or the Judeans, and then the, the, who then become the Jews, managed to retain their communal identity and then renew it and uh, rebuild the identity and the Jewish cultural center in, in Ju Judah. Uh, in what we call the Second Temple period, that's the Persian, Hellenistic, and early Roman period up until the, the Roman destruction of Jerusalem uh, in 70 uh, CE. So there we go. That's the story uh, of the Philistines. And I, and I suggest at this point, um, we can, uh, we can uh, go into ask the questions based on all the various notes that we had um, uh, um, I saw quite a few people added um, chat notes during the uh, during my talk. Okay, Eris. Okay, so there was one question regarding uh, pig bones. Uh, if pig bones are not an uh, indication of uh, Israelite site or a uh, or, uh, Philistine site, what are the uh, significance of, uh, how can you tell the difference? If um, uh, well, that's what we call the $63,000 question. Um, it, it would seem that um, at some sites, it's easy to differentiate between Philistines and Israelites, but other sites, it's not that clear always the, uh, the cultural and group affinity of the various sites. And, and thus, for example, there are sites where scholars argue, is this site Philistine, Canaanite, Israelite, uh, or something else? And and it's not always 100% clear. And I think one of the things that we know uh, uh, today in archeology span is that if at all, if we wanna to try to give identities to groups of people based on material culture, first of all, you have to be very careful 
and pots do not equal people. You can't say, oh, this is an Israelite pot, and that because of that, it's Israelite. You have to look at a very wide set of material culture, and in particular, not only the objects themselves, but how these people conducted their daily life, their practice, and uh, what we call communities of practice represent how various groups uh, identify themselves. Okay. There is a question about uh, Felician's uh, DNA. Do we have any research about it? Philistine DNA. Okay. Um, so they are, they've started to do a research on, on Philistine DNA. There's some results already from Ashkelon. We have some unpublished uh, material from our site and a few other sites. And it's coming out to be very, very interesting. Some of the people seem to be of uh, non-local origin, perhaps from the Aegean. Some of them seem to be local. And some of them seem to be mixtures of the two. That mean like parents from both sides. And this is something that, that we, we're developing now. And hopefully sometime in the near future, we'll start publishing some very interesting results uh, uh, from these uh, studies. Okay, there's another question. A person says that he saw a um, smaller bath in, the, in the, the region of Greek, and uh, he saw, uh, so, sorry, so smaller in the Felicians. He asked if there were smaller people, if I, I understood him correctly. Again, that the people, that the Philistine people were small? Yeah. <laughs> Are the group uh, of uh, small people in the group of sea people? Um, well, from the, uh, the remains, the skeletal remains that we have of Philistines and of various people that live in the, in the land at the time, the Philistines are more or less the same as everybody else who lived here, and that's, by the way, very important. Uh, we don't have any evidence of giants. You know, I can assure you that if I would find one large um, uh, finger bone uh, of a large size, uh, I'd, I'd publish it. And apparently... The Philistines, as far as their stature, their size, are very similar to uh, the ancient peoples in this region. And by the way, ancient peoples uh, in um, in antiquity in general and Lebanon were all quite shorter than our heights today. Uh, it doesn't mean that they were midgets. It's just their the the average height of someone in antiquity was 15, 20 uh, centimeters shorter than the average height today. Okay, um, there was a question, if the, the Israelite people in the kingdom of Israel uh, in Samaria, did they eat uh, uh, pigs? And the other question, where did the name uh, Philistians came from? Where did the name Philistia? Okay, first of all, uh, there are sites within the region of kingdom of Israel where we have evidence of uh, pig being eaten. What does this mean? Does it mean that uh, they, they were non-Israelites living in the Israelite sites, were the people who didn't retain a, a tradition of not eating um, a pig, perhaps the tradition developed later, um, it's hard to say, but we find pig in sites within the region of, uh, of the kingdom of Israel, that's for sure. Now, as far as the name Philistia, uh, it's, there are many suggestions, it's probably the Philistines, uh, it's probably a non-Semitic name. Uh, there have been, some people have suggested that it comes from the Semitic term to invade, liflosh, pei lamit shin, but that's not accepted because it appears in the, already in the Egyptian inscription, uh, inscriptions uh, in Medina Habu, as I mentioned. So, uh, for example, one of the suggestions is there is a, uh, a, a Greek, an ancient Greek group called the Pelasgians, and there have been suggested uh, connections with that. But again, it's really up in the air and we don't know. Okay, there's a person here uh, who asked, how can he join the excavations? How can you, okay. Um, so, okay, so first of all, as I said, unfortunately, we're not excavating this summer, but next summer in uh, late June and July of 2021, if hopefully by then this Corona, uh, uh, stuff is over, you know, we'll, we'll knock it out of the ball field. And then what you do is you go to our website, uh, uh, dot, uh, dot wordpress.com, and there you can find information on, on, the, on the season, how to sign up, the online registration, etc. And we'd love you to come. Our team is comprised of people 
all the world, all kinds of backgrounds. And over the years, thousands of people have joined the excavation. And not one at the end of his participation came up to me and say, Aaron, I didn't have a good time. Everybody has a good time. It's always, it's always fun. Okay, um, there's a person ask if there is mention of the Felicians in the book of Genesis. And if you can, uh, something regarding Abraham, can you okay. elaborate? That's a very interesting question. We, of course, in the, in the stories about Abraham in the northwestern Negev, the area of Rar, uh, the Philistines are mentioned. And uh, when we look at the, uh, uh, that question, of course, the, the, the main issue is when is the period that's being depicted occur. When did the patriarchal stories that are depicted there um, happening? Did they happen way before the, the Israelites uh, uh, came to the land? And if so, what are the Philistines doing there? Uh, or perhaps this biblical text is depicting maybe partially uh, uh, remembered events or maybe uh, recreated events which they put in the Philistines into the story. And because it is absolutely clear that there are no Philistines in the land of Israel be before around 1200. If we want to place, um, according to various uh, suggestions, the, the Abraham somewhere around 1800 or 1600 BCE, there ain't Philistines then. And th that's uh, most probably an anachronism, something that's put in later. Now, some scholars will say that the, the events occurred, but they they spiced up the story to make it more familiar uh, for the reader. Just like if you look at a, um, uh, um, a, a Renaissance painting of a biblical events, the people are dressed up as, as Renaissance figures. Uh, that's one possibility. Or another possibility that some scholars will say is the depiction of Abraham is really depicting an early Iron Age uh, time, time frame, and the Philistines uh, fit into that. In any case, the mention of Philistines in the patriarchal stories um, is a is a is a complex problem. Okay, there's a question from a tour guide in Israel that asks why is such a important place like a, a Tel El Safi? It doesn't even have a road together to visit the site, and why is it not a national uh, park? Well, first of all, it is a national park. There's a very good road that leads right to the site. There's uh, recently, they, they even improved it and there's a nice parking lot, et, et cetera, there. And you can go there. It's a national park that you don't have to pay to get into. You can go there. Don't go this week because it's too hot, but next week when it, when it cools down, uh, you're all invited to uh, enter into ways. Ganlovi uh, Tel uh, Safit or Tel Safit National Park. It will take you to the parking lot and go for it. There's signs you can walk around. Okay, uh, there was a question. Uh, when did the people start using iron? And is it true that the Israelites were using uh, the Felicians for their iron? Okay, so uh, in the biblical text, in the story of Goliath, uh, uh, the, the battle between David and Goliath, the story that the Israelites had to go down to the Philistines to get their, um, their, their iron tools. Um, and one of the things that's come out uh, from archaeological uh, excavations in the land of Israel is that at the time, the um, Israelites did have access to iron tools. And recently, we've also found <coughs> a couple of places in Philistia, two in fact from Tel Asafi, where they were making iron and bronze tools. So it seems that biblical depiction that you could understand that there was a monopoly of uh, iron production by the Philistines is not necessarily so uh, based on the archaeological Okay, uh, there's um, someone asked if it's possible to learn a master's deg degree through uh, the web. And um, well, um, we have, as you can see in the slides in the background, a, um, um, a master's degree and doctoral studies in our department. Um, some of the courses are online courses, but to, con to do the entire a master's degree, you have to do some of the courses in Israel at the department uh, because um, our courses are hands-on. You learn pottery, you do a lot of field trips, you participate in excavations. So um, just like you can't become a lifeguard 
um, studying uh, how to be a lifeguard only on the on the uh, on the internet uh, to become an archaeologist and an expert in ancient Israel, you also have to feel the ground. So you can do some of the courses online, but some of them, a substantial portion of them, have to be done in the actual uh, physical presence uh, at, at uh, Bar Ilan. And as you can see in the background, you're invited to come uh, and check it out. And if you have any questions about the courses, about the requirements, um, you're more than welcome to get in touch with the uh, department. Here you can see the email of the department in the final slide. And uh, you can uh, find out information about the various options for studying in the department. There is a uh, most of the, the courses are in Hebrew, but we also have a an English language program, and uh, both for um, undergraduate, graduate, and doctoral studies. And uh, come and join us. I think you'll have a fun time. And one of the really special parts of our department is the fact that we don't only deal with the Philistines or the Israelites or this or that. Uh, students in our department get a very, very broad uh, range of, uh, of knowledge about the land of Israel from prehistory. Those of you who perhaps listened to Nero's lecture about prehistory, prehistory yesterday through modern times. And if you follow the, the eight lectures of this uh, series, um, you'll get from prehistory until modern times. And this is how our students uh, get their, uh, their, their knowledge. And also, just as you can see right in back of me in my background slide, it also includes a lot of field trips, getting to know the land, and participation in excavation. It's a real hands-on, fun program. So if you're thinking about it, join us. OK, and I think uh, that will be the last uh, question for today. Uh, the, one of the most famous battles in history, David and Goliath. How much reality do we have on this battle? How much is it really have, okay, okay. happen? Um, we don't have any evidence of the battle itself. There's no evidence of the battle. But what we can say is the depiction of location of the battle was made by someone who intimately knew the geography of that location. So it's clearly that the person who described this battle, whether the battle occurred or not, knew exactly what he's talking about when he, when, when he or she described the, the battle location. Now, what can we say about the, uh, the battle itself and the figure? So, um, on the one hand, the figure of Goliath has a, has a non-Semitic name, which fits in very nicely with the Philistines. Um, on the other hand, his weapons, his panoply of armor and weapons that he has is a very mixed uh, group of weapons, some of it local, some of it foreign. And also, biblical scholars say that when you look at this, um, at this story, there seems to be a lot of levels a lot of different uh, uh, additions and, and editing in this text. So it's so even if this story did occur, the depiction that we have seems to be a complex, a composite description that probably reflects both early stories of the early monarchy, but also later editions during the Iron Age and perhaps even later. So it's a I would say partially yes, partially no. And it would be great if I could find the, um, the, the tomb of a headless giant uh, uh, somewhere. Uh, and, uh, but so far, we don't have that. OK, I think, it, I think that's it. So thank you very much. And I'm glad that uh, you could all join us. And hope to see you uh, uh, some other time. And, and as join us as students. Thank you very much. Okay, tomorrow will be uh, another biblical um, lecture by uh, Sean Astor. That's right, Professor Sean Astor, uh, Zelig Astor will be talking about the ancient Israelites. Okay, so hope to see you tomorrow.